everything goes back to Newton. Newton didn't just discover the inverse square law. He discovered two more things. One was that knowing the luminous distribution, namely knowing the sun, you could predict the velocities of all the planets. No dark matter. It's absolutely clean and straightforward. That was Newton's first discovery, was he found a law called the inverse square law, and it works for the solar system dramatically. Namely, you know the luminous distribution, you determine the velocities of all the planets. That, in my opinion, is the gold standard for what you need to do in any theory of gravity. You have a law of force, you know the visible material that you can see, and then you have to predict the velocities, predict exactly what's going on. That's step A. Step B, he proves a theorem. It's a very interesting theorem. And it says this, if you have a spherical distribution of matter, and you want to know the force at any point, then the only contributions are coming from material within the region where the object is located. Nothing is coming from the outside. The outside absolutely decouples. Newton proves this theorem. It follows from the inverse square law. And therefore, if you wanted to solve for the solar system the way he did, you didn't need to consider any other sources. Okay? Now, the, the mathematical reason why this happens, the inverse square law force falls like one over the square of the distance but the solid angle grows like the square of the distance, and therefore they cancel. Exactly the same thing happens for, for Coulomb's law in electromagnetism. So with Newton's law, we have two remarkable things. One is knowing the luminous distribution, you get the velocities, and two, you don't need to include anything outside the system of interest. Now, dark matter keeps the second rule, but not the first. In other words, dark matter says we only need to know what's going on within the system itself, but we don't have to restrict to luminous matter alone. In other words, you give up the Newtonian gold standard right away. And that, to me, is not good physics. Nothing to do with what I do. Just simply point blank, that is not the right way to approach the problem. The history of this subject is that I had a National Academy of Sciences fellowship to NASA about 30 years ago, and I was collaborating there with a local physicist called Demos Kazanis. And at that time, I was thinking deeply about the cosmological constant problem, which eventually was called the dark energy problem, only this was many years before the accelerating universe. And I realized that I could control the cosmological constant if the universe had an underlying symmetry, which is called conformal symmetry. Now, conformal symmetry, in its simplest form, simply says, if you take a triangle and you scale it up uniformly, the angles don't change. But if you have a little mass hanging on one of the arms of the triangle, that arm will sag, and then when you scale it up, the angles will change. So the conformal symmetry requires no mass. Now, this was already known to Hermann Weyl, who introduced this, in 1918, just a couple of years after Einstein developed Einstein relativity. And nobody knew what to do about this, because, of course, in the real world, there are masses. However, in modern physics, we've learned that mass can come in through the back door, and this is called the Higgs boson. And so we've discovered that even though you didn't have any mass to begin with, you can generate mass by dynamics. Now, an, a way to think about this, which is very uh, simple, but of course not the complete story, is if you have the inverse square law, then it's true on all distances, including r equals zero, namely at the origin, which means that a particle acts back on itself. And so the question is, could that 
acting back on itself generate the particle mass. And this idea goes back to Poincaré, that a particle could generate a mass by its own self-interactions. And the fancy way of saying that is the Higgs mechanism, but you just need to think an inverse square law, whether it's electrical or gravitational, would blow up at very short distances. And so a particle can protect itself by spreading out, and that would give it an effective mass. So the conformal symmetry, the idea is that mass is entirely dynamical. Now, Demos Kazanis and I um, started to think about could we find a theory that would have that property, namely that all mass would be dynamical and there would be this underlying conformal symmetry associated with the preservation of angles under a, a rescaling of a triangle. And we found that, in fact, Weil himself had written it down. So we said, well, let's solve it and see whether we can just recover Newton's law of gravity, namely without starting with Einstein. Could we start with something different and still get the inverse square law? We worked for six months. The equations are quite complicated, and we managed to solve them, and we found the exact solution. Yes, we got the inverse square law. But we then got something that we absolutely hadn't anticipated. Namely, we got a second force, and that second force was not vanishing at large distances. The inverse square law gets smaller and smaller. It goes like one over the square of the distance. This second force was constant. It did not fall off at large distances. We looked at that. It took us six months to find the equations. <laughs> it took us an afternoon to solve them. And when we got the solution and we saw this extra term, we realized immediately that we could replace dark matter. And that wasn't what we were looking for. And it took me many years to understand this. It took me a lot of further steps. I gradually realized that because I had this force which did not vanish at large distances, Newton's theorem that I can ignore the outside no longer holds. And therefore, the outside must be playing a role. And then when I work out the details, the details work very nicely, and that's the, what's discussed in the essay, shows you how uh, the, the, the numbers come together very nicely. But the basic realization is, I had to break Newton's theorem that you can neglect the outside. And I found a theory where it happens automatically that you can neglect the outside, even though it wasn't what I was looking for when I started working on the theory. Therefore, I had some you know, confidence in this. So the basic idea is that, in principle, a particle is in interaction with every object in the universe, but the effect of the other particles in the universe is not the one that's given by the inverse square law, but it's the one that's given by this additional force, which we discovered that was constant. And so you can't switch off the outside. So why would we think that we can neglect the outside? Only because of Newton's theorem, that for an inverse square law, the outside decouples identically. For any other law of force, the outside does not decouple. And therefore, we have to think in a very different way. We have to think what's going on outside and how does that influence what's going on inside a galaxy. And, you know, that's what, that's what I've worked through. But, that's the, but the main idea is that the notion that we can neglect the outside only comes because of a very specific law of force, namely Newton's inverse square law. Any other law of force you can't neglect the outside. So when you put the outside into the calculations, you have to work it through. And what we studied, 138 galaxies, and we found that we could account for the velocities of all of them, and that's of the order of 6,000 data points. We could account for all of them using this notion that the outside has to be accounted for. And when we did so, we found that we could account for them universally, 
that we only needed to use the luminous matter, and therefore we meet the Newtonian gold standard, namely, we describe the motions of objects knowing the visible distributions. So, if you now go back to the early studies of galaxies, where people measured velocities and found that the velocities were more than they could manage, and so they went on to say, okay, there must be some missing mass. What I say is, it's not missing. It's the rest of the universe. It's been there all along, and it's hiding in plain sight. And you just didn't recognize it as such. On the other hand, if you didn't want to include the rest of the universe, and if you wanted to say Newton, Newton leads to the notion that you can treat systems in isolation, then you would be forced to dark matter. But on the, in the meantime, 40 years of vigorous research has yet to detect any. And so maybe dark matter is an attempt to describe the effect of the rest of the universe as though it were just the material within the galaxy itself. Well, I, l let me tell you that I, I didn't just stumble across, across this notion now. I mean, I, first, I published it quite a few years ago, and what I did in this particular essay was just sort of review where we stand. And the best way that I can describe what I've done is we're now up to 207 galaxies that we've fitted. Now, dark matter needs two free parameters for every galaxy. And that means that they, dark matter fits have 414 more parameters <laughs> than I have. And, you know, that's a pretty, pretty strong argument against it. Now, it turns out that there's a very interesting phenomenological fact that with galaxies, the fourth power of the velocity as measured scales uniformly with the visible matter. But if dark matter is to dominate, then it would have to scale with the dark matter. And the data is saying quite categorically, no, the velocity is scaling with the luminous matter. And for those of us that are in the non-dark matter camp, which there's not many of us, we've taken this very seriously. We're taking, look, the data are telling us that the velocity is scaling with the amount of luminous matter. And therefore, you should not conclude that dark matter is doing the job.